Time now for our panel of political commentators. Susan Smith's a liberal commentator. Tim Powers, a conservative commentator. And Tom Parkin is an NDP commentator. Good to see you all. Uh, Susan, let's talk about the one-year anniversary of the pandemic, a solemn anniversary. But let's focus a little bit on our political leaders and how they've responded to the crisis and how well they've done at putting the pandemic response ahead of, ahead of scoring political points. What have you seen? Well, it is a tough anniversary for Canadian pe Canadians, Peter. There's no doubt it's been a hard year and we've lost a lot of very important people in the country. Uh, but our, the one thing we have learned, I think, is that our politicians are capable of putting politics aside and doing their jobs in terms of what's best for the, com the country. Uh, the partisanship sni sniping at the beginning of the pandemic was parked, and we saw premiers collaborating. We even saw Doug Ford say he liked working with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland and the Prime Minister, and that they were all working very hard. So I think it's what we've learned or the lesson to be taken out of this is that this country works and it can work, and that our politicians are capable of being less partisan and doing what's right. Yeah, Tim, it's a, it's a delicate line to walk. Have they walked it properly? Because it's not, you know, for opposition parties, it's not about letting the government off the hook on everything, but it's a delicate balance, isn't it? It's a delicate balance. They haven't walked it perfectly every day, but I think they've all done better than we thought they would initially. Um, Andrew Scheer was not was not great in the early days of this, and he corrected himself. Mr. O'Toole's had a couple of moments. Uh, the prime minister even has had some some partisanship flare ups, uh, as have some premiers. But by and large, I think uh, they have all worked as collaboratively as possible in the environment in which we live. And uh, we'll see, Peter, if this bon homme continues after the <laughs> pandemic is passed. Oh, man, a very, very nice words. Tom, Tom, what have you seen as this unfolds? Well, it is that delicate balance. Uh, the opposition has a job to do, even if it's in a pandemic and uh, in the recession of a pandemic. And, and that is to challenge the government to be the best it can, especially in these circumstances. And I, I think, uh, you know, really, Jagmeet Singh did extremely well and has done extremely well over the last year because uh, he tried to not be negative. He tried to uh, put forward positive proposals. So in the very beginning, when there was talk about, you know, how much unemployment there was going to be, um, he said, listen, you know, EI is not going to be enough. There was talk about extending EI. He said, that's not going to be enough. We need something broader because there are a lot of people who do not qualify right. for EI who are going to get affected. And, and, you know, to give Mr. Trudeau his credit, um, he said, yeah, that's right. And CERB was created because of that positive contribution okay. and, thankfully, reciprocation. And the same with Q's, uh, the, the wage support program originally put in at 10% and Singh with small business and labor movement said, you know, it should be higher, and that was eventually supported. And, and later to correct the, the okay, way so they, in which the, the, the support for rent, co commercial rent, was, was organized. They so get pretty positives. Okay, some positives. All right, uh, let's talk, Susan, about allegations of sexual misconduct against senior leaders of the Department of National Defense. We've learned this week now the Prime Minister says his office knew of the allegations in 2018 but never got the details from the military ombudsman, so that's why there was no investigation. He also uh, suggested Conservatives back in 2015 investigated certain allegations against uh, General Vance but still appointed him CDS. Look, what needs to happen to convince members of the Canadian forces that the government governments are serious about dealing with misconduct in the military? Yeah, I think it's time, uh, Peter. There, there are things that have been put into place like Op Honor, but it's clearly there, there's been a gap when it comes to the reporting uh, or the comfort in people reporting and things getting actioned on it. Um, when it comes to General Vance, there were allegations, but no detail and not enough detail to be able to do anything about it. It's clear that's what happened. But um, the, it has to change. There's no question. Things like this need to be investigated when people come forward. People need to feel comfortable coming forward and hopefully we get to the time and the place where these kinds of terrible incidents stop. Tim, to be clear, if the outside organization had been created, uh, which the Prime Minister is suggesting he will now do to investigate these things, if that had been created after Justice, uh, Justice Deschamps, after her inquiry and she recommended that, people with complaints about their superiors would have had a place to go, but since there exists no outside agency, what responsibility did the government have to ensure there was some sort of investigation? I, I, look, I think this is, uh, to be fair, it's it's a problem that different governments have had. But ultimately, Peter, the problem is in the military culture and approach uh, and governments of different stripes' refusal to address that or, or hoping the issue go away. I, I do think Mr. Sajjan 
is in a little bit of trouble here because his answers uh, about how he dealt with the military ombudsman and uh, how material was brought forward to PCO in the prime minister's office doesn't reflect very well on a government that's uh, focused a lot of its energy on addressing uh, harassment and, uh, and issues as such. But you know, a bigger thing here, Peter, it does appear, uh, regardless of government's consternation, uh, that uh, people within the military are having their Me Too movement. And yep. hopefully... Uh, that in the end will be a very positive thing for bringing forward cultural change in the military. It shouldn't have to happen that way, but it appears we're in that moment for the Canadian Armed Forces. Tom, let me hear from you on this. Well, I don't think it's cultural change. I think it's structural change that was needed. That's what the commission in 2015 recommended by setting up a uh, oversight body that could uh, escalate uh, these complaints to. And we've seen the concerns, the complaints of sexual harassment and sexual assault in the CAF absolutely skyrocket in the last few years, while Minister Sajan and the Prime Minister sat on this report, did nothing. Um, and frankly, you know, what, so having done nothing, then we're not only, um, you know, had done nothing, but then we're presented or presented with the opportunity to see specific information, specific and what the military okay. ombudsman said was actionable information about a uh, about General Vance, the, the former CBS. And the, the response of the minister was, I don't want to see it. Um, All right. So apparently I think it becomes a big problem when you don't when you turn back and you want to call, call yourself a progressive. It sounds like finally that, that sounds did, like that didn't support these women. Sounds like finally change may be coming on that file. Uh, Tim, let me come back to you. Conservative convention opens a week from now and heading into it. Lots of talk about Aaron O'Toole's poor polling numbers, caucus unrest, the reopening of the abortion debate, all that with a potential of a snap election. So how deep are Aaron? O'Toole's problems, Tim, and how costly could they be for a party with Justin Trudeau still refusing to rule out a snap election? Well, Peter, you and I have been covering conservative conventions almost since the time of John A. Macdonald. Um, and I, I can't remember a, a moment before a conservative convention where the conservatives were in power or not, to use a good Newfoundland expression uh, with a Newfoundland painting behind me, when the backside was deemed to be out of her. Uh, for the party. Um, O'Toole has some challenges. And I, and I, no Tim, 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 I don't think the term uses the word backside, does it? But uh, <laughs> Well, uh, Peter, I'm not always. I know, audience, you, I know I understand that, and you should. Sorry. And, and, and I should, uh, as, as I should. But, but look, this is the normal noise before convention. O'Toole's challenge is to figure out what the real problems are. So before every convention, there is usually some saber rattling from social conservatives who use conventions to highlight issues of concern for them. If I'm O'Toole, the one thing I am maybe a bit concerned about is the uh, apparent anonymous caucus sources who are right. leaking frustrations. That's what he's got to pay attention right, to. Susan, we'll see how that plays out. Susan, how big of a problem does Mr. O'Toole have? It's a really big problem for Mr. O'Toole because we're in a minority government situation and we could be in an election in less than, you know, less than a year. So I think he's in trouble. He does. He has not won the hearts and minds of the Conservative Party. And he's going into a convention where, the, as Tim says, the social conservatives, there's a whole army of them that are doing saber rattling and they've taken over the delegate spots. And for the people at home, this is a virtual convention. It means so many more people can participate than would normally participate. 5,500 5, have signed up. Yeah. So he, I don't think Aaron O'Toole controls the agenda going into this uh, convention, right. and that is a problem for the leader of a party. Uh, quickly, uh, final comments to you, Tom Pargan. Well, I think the Conservatives Mr. O'Toole's problems aren't, aren't just Mr. O'Toole. The times are not kind right now to Conservatives in many ways. I, I think people expect government to lead the, re, uh, the, re, the economic recovery. They expect government to be involved and uh, to be helping industries get back on their feet. And um, if you're a libertarian, laissez-faire, uh, let government do nothing kind of Conservative, um, what can you possibly offer in these situations? I mean, I can see what Mr. Trudeau might say. I can think of what Mr. Singh might say, but get government out of the way and cut taxes? All right. I don't think that's what Canadians want to hear. I have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you all for your time this week. Uh, we'll be in touch. Take care. Thank you. Cheers.